Hello and welcome to Cost Accounting. Today we're going to talk about cost behavior and cost estimation. The first thing we'll cover in this concept are the fundamentals of cost behavior. Cost behavior is a very important concept to understand because it's important to plan and budget costs, institute measures of cost controls, identify trends in receiving current and previous costs, compare actual costs to their budgeted costs to identify progress and success in controlling those costs, and of course, to predict costs under different future conditions. One of the first things to understand are cost drivers. A cost driver is an activity that causes a particular cost to occur. The cost is the effect of that driver, cause and effect relationship. When it comes to studying costs, it's important to determine the causes that gives us insight into how to best manage those costs. There are three categories of cost behavior. The first is called variable cost. The second is called fixed costs. And the third is called mixed costs. Variable costs are costs that go up and down based on the level of output. Variable costs are costs that go up and down based off of the level of output or the level of activity. They have a constant cost per unit and they change in total based off of their cost drivers. The variable cause represents the direct materials, direct labor, and variable overhead that make up the total cost per unit. On a per unit basis, the cost is the same. On a total basis, the cost rises with the level of usage in the cost drivers. Variable cost depends, of course, on the volume of the cost driver, how many units are being produced. If the cost driver increases, that means there will be a total variable cost increase. Fixed costs are costs that do not change with the level of output. So regardless of the number of units we're producing, fixed costs do not change. Examples of fixed costs include things like supervisors' salaries, depreciation expense, rent expense. These are costs that do not change with the level of output. Fixed costs provide with a resource or a benefit, like machinery, building. The cost that provides access to that resource or benefit is fixed up to the limit of the resource. Supervisor salary, it's fixed up to the resource. Depreciation expense, it's fixed until the asset is fully depreciated. Here is a graphical representation of the relationship between fixed and variable costs. On the left, we see variable costs for gumballs. The more gumballs we produce, the higher the total cost. With respect to fixed costs, an example of that being a party room, the fixed cost of the room remains the same regardless of the number of people that are in or using that room. So again, variable costs increase with the level of output. Fixed costs remain the same regardless of the level of output. Now, 
there are a couple of different ways of looking at costs. And one of those is called a step fix cost. These are fixed amounts over certain volume intervals and jump with a higher cost to the next volume interval. An example of that would be a cell phone plan. The cell phone plan says that we can use up to one gigabyte of data at a certain cost. Once we've exceeded that one gigabyte of data, it the cost rises to the next interval. Once we've used another gigabyte of data, it rises to the next interval, et cetera. Another example of that is the cost of hotel rooms based off of the level of occupancy per room. We can see that four people to a room, one room costs $175. As we add additional people, we step up to two rooms. Four to eight people can fit in two rooms. So again, it's four person per room. If there's more than eight people, eight to 12, that's three rooms, et cetera. This is an example of a step fix cost. The third type of cost is what we consider to be a mixed cost. This is a combination of both fixed and variable costs. An example of that would be leasing a copying machine. The lease agreement states that we pay for the copying machine on an annual basis for the use up to 30,000 pages. Once we've exceeded the 30,000 pages, it's one cent per page. So the fixed cost is the lease of the machine for the use up to 30,000 pages. The variable cost is one cent per page after the 30,000 page limit has been reached. That would make it a mixed cost. So it's fixed up when the volume or activity is zero and rises based off of the level of output. Other examples include things like the uh, utility bills, such as electricity or water. There is a service fee for accessing the utilities grid. Once the utilities grid has been accessed, the variable cost is based off of the usage. So for electricity, it's based off of a kilowatt hour of use. For water, it's based off of a per gallon use. Another example would be cleaning fees. There's a fixed fee for the cleaning service plus hourly charges for the rate. A lot of costs have what we consider a relevant range of costs. This is a specific relationship between the activity and the cost being measured. It's within a range of costs. Fixed costs always remain fixed. The unit variable costs are constant. Per unit, the cost is the same. The total cost rises with the total output. Within the relevant range, the relationship between fixed and variable costs and total costs is likely to hold constant. Here we see a linear relationship. Sorry. Here we see the linear relationship. We see that the total cost of the activity is based on the variable cost times the activity level plus the total fixed cost. That gives us the total cost, variable plus fixed. The variable cost is determined by the variable times the number of units being produced. And we can see that the linear cost relationship is constant 
rises with the level of output. Oftentimes we think about capacity in a manufacturing setting. The capacity tells us the number of units that we can produce in a single setting. The plant and the number of units being produced in that plant at a maximum. That provides us with a maximum capacity or output. Here we have fixed costs of $3 million, the plant, and we have the number of units being produced at its maximum capacity, 300,000. And looking at capacity, we can determine the relevant range. What we just saw was the factory rent. $3 million. And we saw the level of output, 300,000 units per year. Therefore, we can calculate the relevant range from zero to 300,000 units per year. What would happen if the capacity of production increased by 25,000? That, of course, would bring us to 325,000 units of total output. In order to do that, we would need more factory space and equipment. There would be a higher fixed cost rate because of the larger space and the additional depreciation on the equipment. This would result in an increase in the relevant range based off of the capacity. Increasing the capacity in a manufacturing setting could include something like the use of automation. Here we have the visual graphic as we increase the relevant range. Our original range was zero to 300,000 units. We've increased that by 25,000 units. So our new range goes up and it also increases the fixed cost. Now we can look at that from a linear perspective. And thinking about linear cost as a function, we can identify various scenarios. Here we have a scenario. We have a room for rent for capacity of 15 people. The cost of the room is $180. Our variable cost is $3 per person. Based off of this information, we can identify the linear cost as a function. So the fixed cost is $180. The variable cost is $3 per person. As we reach the 15 people, we see that it rises by $3 per person, variable cost. Total cost is fixed cost plus variable cost. The total cost rises with the increase in variable cost. But it's at a starting point of the fixed cost. So even if it's zero people, there still has to be a fixed cost to be paid. $180 in this example at zero. The total cost would reach a maximum of $225 for the room based off of the 15 people in that room plus the fixed cost. There are two very straightforward methods of estimating costs. The first is called the account analysis method. This uses the actual costs within the general ledger to predict future costs. We review the account totals and the individual invoices that make up the total amount of the account to get an understanding of how that cost works. 
There are fixed costs to be determined by looking at contracts, commitments, and other constraints each month. Here we have an example of a water bill. We can determine the future water expense. How do we do that? We look at the current data in the ledger. So looking at the water bill and the general ledger account for water expense, we can identify that we have a fixed and variable cost within that water bill. We have a fixed cost, which is the base fee of $770. And we have a usage fee of $1,709. And of course, we can extrapolate this on a monthly basis. As we extrapolate it out for a year, we can estimate that our total cost for the year would be $9,240 based off of a usage of a, of a fixed rate fixed cost of $770 times 12. However, that is just the fixed amount. In order to extrapolate this further, we need to estimate the usage by looking at the variable cost and the usage that may occur over the next 12 months. So to do that, we take our fixed cost and we extrapolate further. So we can determine how much water expense will look like for that year based off of that information with an expectation that the business will use 10% less water in the next year based off of a decrease in production. Another straightforward method is called the high-low method. This uses actual costs in order to make predictions in the future for mixed costs. We use the high points of data and the low points of data that have occurred throughout 12 months. So here's the calculation using a very straightforward approach. M, which is the slope of the line, we take data point two minus data point one divided by data point two minus data point one, where X is the high value and Y are the low values. Showing you in a more logical graphical method, we have identified the low points of the year and the high points of the year. We plug those into our formula. And based on the formula, we, we can generate the line, the slope. The independent variables x typically increase with the level of activity. The dependent variables usually increase as well when the level of activity increases. The higher we set an indoor temperature, for example, during the winter months, we'll use more energy costs, which is a form of heating. And looking at the high-low method, we analyze that the highest and lowest values are based off of the cost drivers. The high-low method data points in a range which may not be representative of the remaining coordinates in, our, in the sample. So it's important that we understand the various points of data before making an analysis. Here we have a set of data, number of mugs made and their actual costs, X and Y, and the years of production. And using the high-low method, 
first we look at the lowest point of X and the highest point of X. Based off of this data, we can see that the lowest point of X is year one. And the highest point of X is in year seven. For the actual cost, the lowest cost is year two. And the highest cost is in year seven. Based on that information, we can see there's not a direct correlation between X and Y. However, we can extrapolate the pattern by plugging those data points in. Once we plug those data points in, we can find that the slope of the line is $12.04. This helps us, of course, to determine a plausible equation where we take the $12.04 times the level of output plus the fixed costs to, to find the total cost. Using the high-low method, Here's the line of our total cost. Another method is by using the scatter plots. Scatter plots help us to determine an estimation where the line is drawn in between the high and low points. Helps us to visualize a range of data where there are outliers in the information. Users can identify out the outlier information by making relevant observations in the data. Another method is called regression analysis. Using regression analysis, also known as the least squares regression or linear regression, we use every point in the data in a mathematical computation to minimize the vertical distance between the given data points. In other words, this helps us to eliminate outliers. This is a statistical approach to examining the costs in a linear form. It uses actual costs instead of estimates. The residual is known as the vertical distance between each point that is known. And it's used in a mathematically calculated line that is what we call best fit. And we often use this for predictive purposes. Here's the line that is best fit. We can see the distance between the points and the line are relatively close, except of course for our outliers. In evaluating the regression analysis output, we look at the resulting linear equation that helps us to best select the points of data to use. This method is economic plausible. It's a good fit. The statistical significance is in the slope. Economic plausibility, of course, is can it be done? in a logical way without addition too much cost. Is it a good fit? Looking at the fit is based off the regression that the line fits in the actual observations. Using R2 as the coefficient for determination. The statistical Statistical significance of the slope is used in the regression line and is said to be statistically significant, which is different from zero. We use what's called a t-statistic, also known as a t-stat. We also use the p-values, which are the points of st statistical significance.
using the line intercept approach, we can help us to identify the significance of cost drivers in a statistical manner. The intercept and fixed cost approach helps us to combine the uh, intercept coefficient, which is usually identified as a fixed portion of the cost. A negative intercept is identified here graphically. This helps us to understand the overall production of the company based off of the level of output and the distance between the lines. The relevant range also shows us the relevant correlation between the output and its fixed costs. And of course, here are the assumptions for the regression analysis, that they're linear, there's a constant variance in the residuals, independence in the residuals, and normality of the residuals. The assumption can be that we can create a scatter plot and evaluate it for a, real, a linear relationship. Of course, we could use regression to do the same. Although regression is only going to use the actual data points, does not always fit well. Here we have an example of Xavier Company, which is a manufacturing company that is uh, creates insulated windows. We've inputted the statistical data using regression analysis in Excel, and we've been able to produce uh, the linear relationship using Excel. Regression analysis uh, certainly has its challenges, and for the purposes of this course, we we typically do not utilize regression analysis, although it's a very important for you to understand how regression analysis works. And that is the point of, to this overall exercise. We can also utilize multiple regressions to help us to identify the best fitting model when it comes to predictive analysis using statistics. Multiple regression analysis considers three validity points that need to be satisfied, economic plausibility, good fit, and the significance of the slope. The output from running this model in Excel, of course, has a singular regression model. We evaluate the outputs based and we checked the, the validity of the entire model using this criterion of economic plausibility, good fit, and significance of slope. The biggest takeaway I want you to have from regression analysis are those three significant points. And of course, we can also estimate nonlinear costs using the learning curve. The learning curve, of course, is understanding the relationship between the level of output and the number of hours for production observed in a nonlinear relationship. Here's an example of that learning curve. When I think of a learning curve, I think of how long it takes to learn a new task. And learning that new task, once we've learned how to complete that new task, the learning curve, of course, shallows off. Here's an example of building an airplane and what the learning curve looks like in relationship to the number of hours it takes to, to build that aircraft. First aircraft, of course, takes the most amount of hours because it's a new process. But once you've done quite a few of them, the learning curve decreases. And of course, we have uh, improved cost savings in, in that relationship. And 
And here's another example of that learning curve. The formula that we use for the learning rate is a, the learning rate percentage divided by two. Here's an example of baking bread using a learning curve. These are the calculations, the number of units produced, and the time it takes. And we can see based off of this information where the, where the, the curve levels off based off of the time it takes, which is right around seven units. Improves overall efficiency. These curves come in handy when it comes to understanding efficiency. Applying a linear cost function to labor requires the same time to produce it. Okay, so this is not a short or easy process to understand, to be able to implement it. But there is a correlation between the cost function and the total labor cost. More units produced over time, the lower that labor cost is. And these are the learning objectives that we covered in this chapter. If you have any questions about cost behavior, cost analysis, please reach out to me. I'm here for your success. Thank you very much for your time today. I appreciate you.